We have just two parts left in our China unit. The first one is the invasion of the Mongols in 1200 CE, and the second one is not even China, it's the Japanese. So the first, as you can see on the screen, is the Mongols <coughs> are going to come from the north and invade China, led by their great ruler, Genghis Khan, and he is going to establish the Mongol Empire, which is going to be the largest in world history. Obviously no pictures of him, but that's a drawing of what he might have looked like. The Mongols came in huge numbers, so they're often referred to as the Mongolian Horde, a horde being a large group of overwhelming forces. There's one depiction, and there's another. Uh, Genghis Khan was the greatest ruler. The, the other great ruler was his grandson, Kublai Khan. You can see how large the empire is going to become under those two, the yellow lines. And you can see where they start invading, even into India, which eventually becomes the Mughals, an offshoot of the Mongols, uh, and even into Japan. Uh, sorry, Japan up here, sorry about that, and Korea. And so there's Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan. He's going to found the Yuan, Yuan dynasty. We're still going through the dynastic cycles here. Uh, except that the Chinese hate the Mongols. Obviously, they're invaders from outside. And that's in part why they built the Great Walls, because they wanted to stop the Mongol invasions. Kublai is going to try to win their approval by allowing some of them to be on his ruling court. Uh, they're going to have an expansion of trade during this time period. In particular, one well-known Italian, we believe, came and traded, Marco Polo, came on the Silk Roads and traded, not surprisingly, silk, and also traded for porcelain, which you guys know about from your project. And about 100 years after starting in the 1300s, the Mongols are going to dissipate. And that brings us to Japan. Japan is an archipelago, which is a group of islands. In their case, it's four on the east side of China. So here's China. Here's South Korea, North Korea. And this is the main Japanese island. Two islands, three and four archipelago. Okay, their official religion, or the most widely used religion, is Shintoism. And Shintoism sounds a lot like Taoism in that they have respect for the force of nature and Kami, which is divine spirits in nature. It also sounds a little like something else we learned in terms of worship of ancestors. Think back, how did the Chinese communicate with their ancestors? What did they use? Turtle shell? What is it called? oracle bone and the difference from the earlier time is they really worship the emperor they still have one today but the emperor doesn't have any formal power so shintoism is as i said was the official religion it's still the most practiced religion and it coexists with buddhism so buddhism starts in india goes to china and then goes to Japan. And you're going to see in a second how Japan and China have a lot of similarities. Their writing, their architecture, and even ideas of how to rule their country. For example, the writing. And the architecture. The Japanese are going to be protected, and, and uh, the warriors who are going to help run the country are called the samurai, and they have something called the Code of Bushido. This is literally to be completely courageous. Don't accept any plan, takeover by the enemy. We saw this in World War II. This code was still around back then. 
when dive bombers would get enough gas in their plane to go from the base to our ships and where they would dive bomb and sometimes they even missed the ship but those were called the divine whim, wind or kamikaze and here are a couple of pictures of all the suits of armor and now I'd like you to watch the short film on the religion and Shintoism. First, you got to watch an ad, though. Japan, a country famous for both its enchanting traditions and its immense economic wealth and growth. Over the past several decades, Japan has developed to be one of the leading world powers. It now boasts the second largest market economy in the world. Yet even as Japan progresses so rapidly, many of its magnificent traditions have largely been preserved. Japan's wonderfully rich culture is celebrated for its ornate costumes and attire, its intricate and diverse artwork, and its elaborate and stunning architecture. Two staples of Japanese culture still present today are the Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples found across the country. Shinto is the native religion of Japan and was once its state religion. While it has no written body of doctrine, it is Japan's main religion and is practiced widely with ceremonies and festivals. Shinto shrines are where its believers go to worship. Almost all Shinto shrines are built in isolated wooded areas and are very oriented towards nature. There are many lucky charms and other such objects to be seen at a shrine. Most are used to determine the will of the gods and some as a way of asking for their protection. Another central facet of Japanese culture is the Buddhist temple. Temples are a place of worship for millions of Japanese Buddhists. Virtually every Japanese municipality has at least one temple, while large cultural centers like Kyoto have several thousands of them. Buddhism spread to Japan from India and China in the middle of the 6th century. Shortly after, Shinto and Buddhist beliefs began to influence one another. Today, you can find Shinto elements in many Japanese Buddhist temples, and likewise, Buddhist traditions have influenced the development of Shinto shrines. Nonetheless, unlike the Shinto shrines, Buddhist temples are built in open areas for all to see, and the architecture is much more complex and elaborate. Most, if not all, Buddhist temples exhibit the same basic design elements as other traditional Japanese buildings. Many temples are built mostly out of wood, and oftentimes no nails are used to hold the wooden beams together. All temples store and display sacred Buddhist objects. The most sacred object is the Buddha himself, often located in the inner sanctuary, where worshippers stand to pray by pressing their palms together. Food offerings are frequently placed in the inner sanctuary to pay respect to the Buddha and other deities. Another significant feature of most Buddhist temples is the outside garden often located in the middle of the complex. Temple gardens possess ancient stones that represent different symbols, oftentimes a deity, an animal, or a spirit. In this incredibly peaceful and serene setting, monks and sometimes visitors gather to relax and meditate. One big bell is usually located in the temple complex. On New Year's Eve, the bell rings 108 times. They ring the bell 8 times in the old year and 100 times in the new year. This number is significant because 108 is the number of worldly desires in Buddhism that are driven away by the ringing of the bell. As you can see, Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines are truly a symbol of traditional Japanese culture. It's nice to know that even as the world rapidly changes,